Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to the second lecture of 6837. Uh, this is actually the first lecture that I'm filming because I figure the uh, first lecture of the course is going to require some special changes uh, for our, our new course setup this year. Uh, so if there are any mistakes in the filming, they're likely to happen today. Uh, in any event, uh, we're going to get started with the uh, heavy technical content of the computer graphics world uh, by talking about how we model uh, curves and splines on a computer graphics system. So let's get started. First, I'll tell you a little bit about our plan for today. Uh, our main goal for today is to develop some technology for essentially representing short segments of curves in two dimensions. Here, curves are exactly what you remember from geometry class. They're just two-dimensional shapes that are bent. And we're going to do that specifically using some tools that you all know and love from your linear algebra course. These, the reason that I'm using the phrase curve segment instead of curve uh, is that we're only going to describe very simple shapes today, you know, like S shapes and U shapes and so on. But these are going to be the building blocks for longer curves, uh, which is going to be the topic of our next lecture, uh, I guess, next Tuesday. So there are many different ways to motivate why the very first thing that we should talk about in a computer graphics class is drawing a curve. Um, what we're going to see is that curves appear all over the place. I mean, the obvious places that we see curves are in software like Adobe Illustrator, uh, PowerPoint, and so on, where you're actually drawing shapes. Um, but of course, representing curves uh, also appears on your computer. Uh, for example, on this uh, very PowerPoint slide, in just about every square inch of your screen, right? Because the basic building block of every single character in your font uh, is nothing more than the types of curves that we'll be talking about in this course. Moreover, we're going to use curves in the next couple lectures, not just to represent shapes, but also to represent changes over time, right? So we can think of a curve in time as animating a 3D character, defining how things move in a scene, and so on. So it's one of these really simple, versatile objects that we're going to use and reuse in this course. But for now, if you want a concrete motivation for why we need to talk about curves, you really can start in the really simple rendering style computer graphics world. In particular, uh, here's one simple motivation. One of the basic themes that we're going to see in this course is that we can get a lot of complexity in a rendered scene by doing fairly simple uh, operations many, many times. And so, for example, the graphics card in your computer is really good and specialized at drawing just a few shapes, uh, in particular, triangles and line segments. But of course, modeling everything out of individual triangles and line segments is extremely, extremely complicated. Uh, so for example, uh, let's say that I were in a piece of software and I modeled this uh, curve that you see on the bottom left and I wanted to edit it to make it a little bit taller. Uh, then of course, if I modeled this object out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven line segments and I want to make it taller, what would I have to do? I'd have to grab one, two, three, four, five points and move every single one of them in order to uh, get a new shape. And so, of course, when you use tools like PowerPoint, uh, that's not necessarily what happens, but rather you have a few simple controls that are telling a more expressive story uh, about an object. So that way, if you want to edit it, then, for example, instead of having to move every single one of these vertices to get a taller U shape, Maybe I just edit a few high-level controls that are really what I want to expose to an artist. And so that's really the uh, perspective that we're going to pursue today and in the next couple lectures. I'm really struggling with the next slide button. So what do we want here? Essentially, what we want is a high-level representation of a curve and eventually a surface. We're going to talk about 3D stuff. But since our graphics card only knows how to draw line segments and triangles, we need to be able to take this high-level representation that's convenient for humans, and it needs to be easily convertible behind the scenes by our algorithm into lines, triangles, and, and, and other sort of simple pieces. But there are many different ways to solve this kind of a problem, um, and we're going to talk about a few in this course. So before going into the details of splines, which is one of the preferred representations in the computer graphics world, first we're going to talk a tiny bit about just the geometry of curves and surfaces. I can't help it as a geometry professor, uh, but provide you guys with a bit of the basic information, uh, and then we'll dig into the details. So in general, when we talk about a curve, uh, 
um, from your math class, you might remember that a curve is, is what we might call a one-dimensional object, right? It's a set of points where if I held a magnifying glass and I zoomed in really, really close uh, to those points, eventually they'd be indistinguishable locally from a line, at least away from cusps and other sharp features. Uh, and similarly, uh, a surface is something that might be bent and have curvature and so on, but if I take my magnifying glass close enough to the surface, eventually it looks like a plane. Notice that these two perspectives align really well with the two basic primitives that your graphics card knows how to render, right? The, uh, the line segment, uh, which is sort of the local representation of a curve, and the triangle, which is kind of like a local representation of a surface. So that's going to be the basic uh, intuition that's going to take us from these high-level representations to these low-level ones. Now, there's a few mathematical notions that are worth uh, bringing up before we get too far. Um, one of the basic ones that I think trips up some students is talking about what it means for an object like a curve or surface to have dimensionality. Now, when we think of a one-dimensional universe, we think of a straight line. A curve somehow feels like a one-dimensional object, but it's also a two-dimensional object, at least a curve on the plane, right? Because, of course, we can think of our curve as sitting on the xy axes and so the curve is taking up some region in two-dimensional space it's a really really thin region but at the same time if we take the perspective of a car driving along the curve then it can sort of trace out that curve as a function of time which is a one-dimensional object right so the way that we can distinguish that um, some of the mathematical terms that people use is that a curve is intrinsically one-dimensional but extrinsically two-dimensional or maybe extrinsically three-dimensional if it's sitting in 3D. Now, in 6837, we're not going to get totally hung up on that terminology. Uh, next semester, if you take my 6838 course, we'll really dig into that. But it is worth noting that there are many different perspectives, even on these simple uh, geometric figures. Now, in this class, uh, and in the computer graphics world more broadly, we often focus on a particular expression of curves and surfaces, and this is known as parametric uh, geometry. So the basic idea of parametric geometry is that I'm going to express, for example, a curve as a function from the line. So for example, gamma maybe is a function from the real numbers into the plane. Uh, not sure what happened there. Which says, you know, I can think of it, you know, to continue the analogy from the last slide, if I'm a car driving along uh, the curve, then essentially this function gamma is saying at time t, where is my curve? Uh, where, where does the car, uh, where is it located along the curve? Right, and so if you think of the exhaust coming out of the back of the car, then somehow the curve as a piece of geometry uh, is what's left behind, right? It's, it's the, the, the geometric figure. And similarly, uh, a parametric surface would be a function not of one, but of two variables, u and v, for example, the letters might change uh, depending on my, uh, my mood, uh, which essentially is tracing out uh, the surface in two different directions. Now, there's something a little bit weird about parametric geometry that's worth noting. Um, and this is something that you really get hung up on if you're in the differential geometry world. And that is, for example, for a curve, what, what does this T matter? <laughs> um, it sounds kind of goofy. If, if, if you take calculus class, uh, somehow it doesn't matter. Uh, but of course, for example, if a car drives along this curve at twice the speed, as long as the car traces out the same path as the exhaust pipe, it's actually still the same curve. So a kind of funny thing can happen in parametric geometry, which is that multiple functions gamma of t might actually trace out the same geometric uh, object. All right, so let's do uh, some exercises here. So let's say that I wanted to parameterize a line. Uh, so I want to come up with a parametric expression for this piece of geometry. There are many different ways to do it. Uh, so let's do one example. So maybe I choose a point along this line. Notice that this is non-unique, but one point I could call gamma naught, which is in the plane. And moreover, I could, for example, choose a second point and subtract it off from gamma naught to get a vector and call that vector d. Well, notice that I can find any point along the line by starting at gamma naught 
and then scaling D by some positive or negative value to get any other point along the curve. So if I wanted a parametric expression of the line through gamma naught in the direction D, one way that I could write it would be as follows. I could write a function gamma of t is equal to gamma naught plus t times d. Now this is already a great example of the non-uniqueness that I brought up in the previous slide. For example, I could scale d by 2 and I would still have the same piece of geometry in the plane. It would just be parameterized in a different fashion. Here's the same thing in nicer handwriting than what I wrote down on the previous slide. Now, this is obviously a very simple piece of parametric geometry, uh, but there are many other ones out there. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to make a parametric circle, one way that I could do it uh, would be to use gamma of t equals cosine of t comma sine of t. If you're curious, one way to understand this parametrization would be to, this is by the way the unit circle uh, located at the origin, which is zero. So if I draw a line horizontally from the origin, then of course all of us know from trigonometry class that t is nothing more than the angle uh, from the direction out to the right. Hopefully I did that right. I always get uh, sine and cosine backward. <laughs> uh, so to, uh, yeah, so the cosine is the x. Yep, so this is correct. All right. Now, before we dig into parametric geometry in a lot of detail, uh, it is worth acknowledging that this is one of many ways to express a shape. So a second really common uh, way to express a shape uh, in the computer graphics world is to use implicit modeling. So in implicit modeling, what we do uh, is we think of a shape as the level set of some function. So for example, if I wanted to express a curve in the plane, one way that I could do that would be to write down a function f of x comma y for every single point in the plane, and then say that my curve is the set of points that uh, f take, uh, where f takes on the value zero. This is sometimes called a level set or an isocontour of my function. Uh, now there are advantages and disadvantages to implicit modeling versus uh, explicit or parametric uh, geometry. We're not going to talk about it a ton. Um, one thing you might think about uh, is that it's quite difficult, in fact, in some sense impossible, to model an implicit curve that doesn't form a closed loop uh, with, uh, without using some kind of strange uh, functions that you probably wouldn't want to work with in practice. But on the other hand, if I want to animate curves, and I think that they're going to split apart, that might be very difficult to do in a parametric fashion. Right? So for example, implicit modeling is quite popular in areas like fluid simulation, where you know, if I'm dropping water into a bucket, things are connecting and disconnecting all the time. Whereas in software like PowerPoint and Illustrator, where the artist is typically going to want to draw open curves, uh, the explicit or parametric model is going to be the more popular one. These are, of course, all sweeping generalizations. And with each one of these things that I say, there will be many different exceptions to the rule. OK, so our goal in today's lecture and continuing next time uh, is to model curves and specifically to model smooth curves, right? So we don't want these weird jagged options that polylines uh, give us. Uh, so the considerations that we're going to think about as we model uh, these curve objects is that we want them to be easy to edit. Right? That's for the human part of the interface. We want them to be easy to convert to polylines so that we can draw them easily and work with them computationally. And in the back of their, our heads, at least the back of my head as your instructor, uh, we're going to also use representations of curves that are going to be easy to extend to representations of surfaces uh, over the next couple lectures so that we can talk about 3D modeling. Now, to digress a little bit, let's talk about some of the applications of curves in computer graphics. I think the two really basic ones that we'll talk about in this course are vector graphics and animation curves. So vector graphics are software like Inkscape, Illustrator, PowerPoint, and some other ones. Um, these are uh, tools that artists and really home users use to draw um, visual content on the computer. There's a big distinction between vector graphics and raster graphics. So in vector graphics, all the geometry in the image is stored, for example, as a big set of curves, like this image of the car that you see on the left-hand side. Whereas in raster graphics, uh, that would be like storing one color of a pixel uh, on an entire grid. Right? So 
Uh, the typical distinction is that raster graphics would be for photography and vector graphics would be for design. Um, but again, there are many exceptions to all these rules. Uh, another set of curves that we're going to talk about quite a bit in this course uh, come from animation. So for example, maybe we want to trace out the path of a bouncing ball, uh, not just in space, but also in time. So in that case, this t variable that I told you doesn't matter in the vector field case, right? That's like the car driving along in its exhaust pipe uh, will start to matter again. Now, of course, these are very simple examples. Uh, the reality is that uh, modern graphics software has a demand for tons and tons of curves, um, complete control over the geometry, uh, and many different special cases, including how they meet up, um, how they interact with one another, uh, and so on. So they appear not just uh, in the applications we talked about, but in designing fonts, um, drawing floor plans, and, and, and lots of other places, each of which uh, has its own sort of trade-off between control, expressiveness, and other uh, considerations. Now, once we have a curve represented with one of these high-level things, I alluded to the fact that eventually we're going to have to draw it on the screen, and somehow your graphics card can do that quite well. Uh, there's an interface in between these two parts, uh, which is a technique called tessellation. This is a good vocabulary word for everybody. And the basic point of tessellation, uh, which we're going to really worry about when it comes to surfaces, but this is a term that we can use for curves as well, is that since we only know how to draw line segments on our computer screen, we need a way to take a smooth object and convert it into a series of line segments. And a different way of saying that is we want to tessellate a piece of geometry with simpler geometry. Um, and, and this is essentially going to help us deal with the fact that drawing an arbitrary polynomial parametric curve typically isn't built into your computer, but drawing a straight line is. So the basic representation that we want to end up with eventually is something called a polyline. A polyline is just a collection of line segments like what you see on the screen. The pros are that polylines are easy to store, right? It's just a big sequence of points and they're easy to render, but they're hard to smooth out and they're hard to edit, right? If I wanted to take this curve and make it a little bit wider, I would have to move a bunch of different points in order to accomplish that. So instead, we're going to work with these higher level representations and convert them into polylines. And the basic tessellation technique is pretty much exactly what you would expect. So if I have this smooth parametric curve, remember that means that I have some function gamma of t, well, then I can tessellate it by just putting in a bunch of different values of t to get a sequence of points. And then the resulting polyline I get by just storing that sequence of points is what I'll actually draw on the screen. Now, of course, this isn't a very good approximation the way that I've drawn it. If I want to make my tessellation better, well, what do I do? I just sample more t values and it gets closer and closer to the curve. Now, of course, there's an expressive uh, or there's a pretty much direct uh, relationship between computation time and the number of curve segments here. Uh, and so, of course, if you tessellate too finely, you might grind your graphics tool down to a halt. Okay, so the polyline representation of a curve is easy to work with computationally, uh, but it's hard to model. And really, there's a big push-pull between these two demands, right? Expressiveness and simplicity. On the one hand, I can approximate just about any weird, crazy, smooth curve using a dense enough polyline, but uh, it's not a particularly easy representation to work with uh, in some user interface or, or even uh, in certain algorithms. Of course, there are boundary cases impossible to work in the space of all possible curves because it's infinitely dimensional. Uh, and moreover, uh, polylines are pretty hard to model. So in this course, we're going to focus on a slightly better compromise between expressiveness and simplicity, at least as an intermediate representation between the artist and the lower level rendering tool. And this is known as a spline. And this is a particular type of smooth curve in two and three dimensions. And it's arguably the most widely used piece of geometry in the computer graphics world for any number of different applications from 2D illustration to storing fonts like in PostScript or TrueType format to 3D modeling and storing trajectories of animated uh, characters. So here's some general principles when it comes to modeling a spline. 
Uh, a spline is determined by a set of control points. It's like the points that I've drawn on this uh, curve on the bottom right. But notice that the curve isn't a polyline. It's not just a collection of line segments anymore. These control points are controlling some higher level aspects of the geometry. And in spline curves, uh, typically the x, y, and z coordinate functions, which are parametric in nature, are, are typically written as piecewise polynomials. So the piecewise here is saying that it's polynomial for different segments of t values. And we're going to see what that means over the next lecture or two. Okay, so here's our plan of attack. Today, we're going to talk about simple one-dimensional curves. These are going to be curves that go through at most like three points. And we're going to do that by essentially defining different sets of parametric curves and figuring out how to make them go through points, have prescribed tangents, and so on. Next, we're going to essentially lift our curves in a higher dimension. So our, our initial curves are going to be one-dimensional, just functions of time. Then we're going to go from time into like points in space. And then in our next lecture, we're going to make more complicated curves, essentially by gluing together these simple building blocks. Normally I'd pause here and ask for questions, unfortunately, in a uh, film lecture, that's a bit tricky. Now, why are we going to all of this effort? Well, in some sense, the basic high level motivation here is that the space of all possible curves is too darn big, right? The uh, space of all curves includes polynomials, it includes circles and ellipses, it also includes space filling curves and fractals and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, of course, we can't represent every possible curve on a computer. We have to make a compromise and decide about a reasonably expressive set of objects that covers uh, most of the things that we might want to draw, store, represent, and so on. How are we going to do that? Well, in 6837, um, and in just about any other course in our EECS department in, in this kind of modeling world, we're going to use linear algebra. In particular, we're going to use a set of basis functions. So remember that I can think of a curve as some function gamma of t. Sorry, it keeps drawing this line here, which is not great. So what am I going to do? I'm going to write gamma of t essentially as some linear combination of simple curves phi i of t. So maybe my linear combination weights are a i, and the different basis curves are phi i of t. Right, so the more phi i's that I throw into the mix, the more expressive my set of curves is, uh, but of course the higher cost uh, we have for representing any one curve. So what we're going to do is we're going to represent our simple curves using a collection of basis functions that we'll define, and then we're going to talk about a different set of machinery for splicing them together. And the specific basis functions we're going to use a lot in this course are polynomial functions. You know, things that are like lines, quadratic things, cubic things, and so on. So let's get started. Here's one set of basis functions that I think would be the first one that we would all think of if I told you I wanted to use polynomials, and that's a monomial basis. So let's say that I wanted to represent curves uh, that were up to second order. So in other words, basically parabolas. Well, I can write any parabola as a linear combination of three functions, right? The constant function, the function 5t equals t, and the quadratic function 5t equals t squared. So for example, let's say that I have the function f of t equals 1 minus t plus t squared. Then of course I can write that as phi naught of t, right? Remember that's just 1, minus phi 1 of t, because that's t, plus phi 2 of t, says so t squared. Now, why would I go to all this extra crazy notational effort? Um, well, essentially, what it's going to allow us to do is to use language from linear algebra when talking about curves. And here's how we do it. So what can I do? I can write down my monomial basis of curves. That's what's shown on the top of the slide. And now, if I have a curve that's in that basis, for example, this function f of t that we have on the slide, well, remember that it's 1 times phi 0 plus minus 1 times phi 1 plus 1 times phi 2. So I can identify this curve with the vector 1 minus 1, 1. And so long as we agree that we only care about quadratic curves, 
every single quadratic curve can be thought of as a vector of three values. Notice we're being a little sneaky in 6837. Your first uh, application of linear algebra isn't just to draw a shape, but rather to trace out a curve. We're getting a little complicated here. So in fact, the linear algebra you know, analogy, tool set, whatever, uh, really extends uh, quite deeply in uh, this parametric curve universe. So for example, let's say that I had a four-dimensional curve, right? A function from t to four different coordinates, um, like x, uh, y, z, and w. Well, uh, if I had a collection of four different coordinate functions, like what I've shown you on the left-hand side, one way that I can write that is actually using matrix vector multiplication, right? So here I have the monomial basis functions, right? 1, t, t squared, and t cubed. So if my x coordinate is the function 1, well, remember that matrix multiply goes left to right in the first argument, top to bottom in the second argument. So that's 1 times 1 plus 0 times t plus 0 times t squared plus 0 times t cubed. That gives us the function 1. Similarly, if I want the function 1 plus t, well, what do I do? I have 1 times 1 plus 1 times t plus 0 times t squared plus 0 times t cubed and so on. So notice that essentially what we've managed to do here is totally get rid of all of this weird nonlinear stuff and just think about the nice linear pieces uh, on their own. And though this is a really convenient way to work with parametric geometry so long as we work in a basis. Now, there are all kinds of tricky problems uh, here. And one of them is precisely how we want to represent a curve. So one of the big issues with the monomial basis, right? So let's say that I want to talk about cubic curves. Well, if we do our degree of freedom, you know, a cubic curve is like A, plus bt plus ct squared plus dt cubed, right? So four numbers determine a cubic curve, a, b, c, and d, meaning that there's sort of four degrees of freedom to work with. So in principle, maybe I want to represent a cubic curve um, using uh, four points, right? I want the cubic curve that goes through four locations. And I know I can do that because there are four degrees of freedom that express a cubic curve. Unfortunately, that gets pretty tricky, uh, and here's the reason why. So, in general, when you use polynomials to interpolate between points, there's some really strange phenomena that can happen. So, here uh, is a really simple degree one polynomial, uh, which I can use to draw a line, right? So, um, in degree one, there are two coefficients that I can write down, meaning that I can write down a curve that goes through two points. I think we can all agree about that. Or let's say that I add a third basis function to the mix, right? So now I have one t and t squared. Now it's absolutely the case that I could come up with a parabola that goes through three different t values, right? I could express, you know, the value at t naught, t one, and t two. That's that's perfectly fine. But uh, what's going to be the issue? Well. Let's say that I wanted to make a piece of software like Adobe Illustrator, and the artist draws these three points and asks me for the curve that goes through them. Well, I drew you a curve that goes through these three points, but probably, I don't know, intuitively, I think what we would expect is a curve that looks something more like what I've drawn on the screen here. And the reason is that this curve has an unexpected region where something kind of weird goes on. This is a strange feature of my curve, right? I specified three points, but somehow the most interesting part of the curve, like its peak, didn't actually occur at any of those locations. And so it turns out that interpolation is not necessarily the best way to uh, express a polynomial curve. So in other words, if I'm gonna work in the set of polynomial basis functions, I might want a different set of degrees of freedom for expressing a piece of geometry. So hopefully I've convinced you all that adding more and more points to polynomials and interpolating through all of them is not a good idea. So instead, let's try a different way to specify a curve. Now, uh, one thing that we could do, rather than just specifying a bunch of points where our curve segment goes through, 
uh, is instead to specify not just the points, but also the derivatives of the curves at those points. So specifically, uh, one simple way to specify a curve might be to give two points on that curve and also two tangent vectors along the curve. Uh, and, and so this new representation uh, is kind of a nice one to work with. In fact, probably if you've played with PowerPoint, Illustrator, software like that, you actually have manipulated a curve in this representation, right? Oftentimes you see curve and then like little line segments sitting on it uh, that are, are giving the controlling the direction of the curve through those two points. Uh, and that's using uh, the techniques that we'll talk about right now. So specifically, let's talk about whether we can figure out a way to find a polynomial curve that goes through two points and where we specify the slope of our curve at those two points in time. So the first question we should ask is what degree polynomial do we need? Well, how much information is going into our curve? We get two points, right? So that's two values. Remember that here when I use the word curve, really I mean function, right? I mean a function from t into one value. Later on, we're gonna lift that to functions from t into multiple values. So in any event, to specify our curve, we have two points, but now we additionally have two slopes. So that means that we have four pieces of information total. Okay, this is one of these common uh, questions that I love to put on exams just to trip up students and be a tough professor. So what degree polynomial do I need if I have four degrees of freedom that I need to specify? Well, what's a polynomial? It would be like a plus bt plus ct squared plus dt cubed, right? That's four. But wait a second, that's t cubed. So if you have four degrees of freedom, then you need a degree three polynomial to express uh, your curve given those four pieces of information, right? So to reiterate, we have these four values, h0, h1, h2, and h3 which are like the value of my function at two points in time, t naught and t1, as well as the derivative at those two points in time. And uh, from that information, to get a curve, we need our curve to be at least cubic. And we also don't want our curve to be more than cubic because we don't have any other information to specify our curve. So one thing that we can do to simplify our math a tiny bit uh, is that we're going to assume that t naught is equal to zero and t1 is equal to 1. Now remember we talked about parameterization of curves like our car could drive along our curve at a different speed. We can always reparameterize the curve so that it goes through two points at these two prescribed times t0 and t1 um, as 0 and 1. So it's th this is really not a restricting assumption to make. Okay so let's dig into this a little more. So the technique of prescribing the two values of a function at times 0 and 1 and the slopes of our function at 0 and 1 and trying to find a cubic uh, function that goes through with all that information uh, is a technique called cubic Hermite interpolation. That's what's written on the slide here. And let's work it out in the monomial basis. right? So at the top here, I've given you a function p of t in the monomial basis. If I differentiate it in time, I get p prime. Hopefully you guys all remember your derivative rules, right? So, you know, for instance, if I differentiate a t cubed, the derivative of that is 3a t squared and so on. Now, what information do I have? Well, in effect, uh, what I'm given is the value of my curve at time zero, right? It's like p of zero. I'm given the value of my curve at time one, that's like p of one, as well as the slopes at those two times, right? p prime of zero, and p prime of 1. Okay, so, uh, well, we've written uh, a version of our curve on the top of the slide. Let's actually just do that computation. So what is p of 0? Well, given the particular form that we've written here, if I plug in t of z, uh, equals to 0, uh, then obviously p of 0 will just equal d. If I plug in t equals 1, well, a t cubed is just a, b t cubed is b, c t is c, and d is d. Similarly, if I plug in t equals 0 into our derivative, then we'll just get c. And if I plug in t equals 1 in our derivative, we'll get 3a plus 2b plus c. 
again, the, this is just plugging t equals 1 into this formula at the top of the slide here. Okay, here are the same formulas written in a nice computerized math font instead of my bad handwriting. Um, and remember that these are exactly the four values that were given to specify our cubic curve. So what is our input and our output here? So we're given these four pieces of information, h0, h1, h2, and h3, which uh, correspond to the value and the slope of our curve at two points in time, 0 and 1. And we're trying to find the function of our curve in the monomial basis. So in order to do that, our unknowns are these values of a, b, c, and d. And if we just look at this piece of our mathematics here, what do we have? We have a linear system of equations. Yeah? So let's write this in matrix form. In particular, uh, at the top of the slide in blue here, this is just the set of relationships that we wrote on the previous slide. And what I've done is gathered these relationships and written them in matrix form. So for instance, if I read the first row of this matrix, I have, you know, remember again, matrix vector multiplication, I go left to right on the first, top to down uh, on the second. So this is 0a plus 0b plus 0c plus d, right? So the first row is just equal to d. Uh, equals h0, which is exactly our first relationship. Second row is like a plus b plus c plus d equals h1, and so on. Right, so this is just a linear system of equations that relates a, b, and c, and d with the h values. Now remember that my input are the h's and my output is the a, b, c, and d. So what do I need to do? Well, I need to invert the matrix on the left-hand side. Now, this isn't a linear algebra course. I'm not going to ask you to invert matrices by hand. That's not a particularly good use of your time. Uh, so instead, you can put it in your favorite piece of software, or in this case, I just give it to you. Uh, so here, I inverted that matrix, and what we get is now a technique for going from the H values to A, B, C, and D. Right. So for instance, if I read the first row here, I see that I can get the value of A as 2 times h0, so let's write it out, a equals 2 times h0, oops, that should be an h, minus 2 times h1 plus h2 plus h3, right? That's just by reading the first row of this matrix times our column vector, and that gives us the value of a, and so on. So notice that uh, if I change the values of the H's, it's still the same matrix that takes me from the H's to the A, B, C, and D values. Okay? So let's write exactly the same math in a slightly different form. So here at the top of the slide, I've written our favorite monomial formula, right? I have a cubic curve, uh, and I've written it as AT cubed plus BT squared plus CT plus D. Right, so in our fancy new linear algebra terminology, we say we just wrote a curve in the monomial basis. Now, from the previous slide, I have formulas for A, B, C, and D in terms of those values of H, right, just by reading that, that matrix vector product. So what I've done here is I've substituted those in. Right? So for instance, remember we wrote that A is equal to 2H0 plus, minus 2H1 plus H2 plus H3 and so on. So that's the, the, the blue box here is just gathered from the previous slide. And now uh, in our last line here, what I've done is factored out uh, the, a, the h values instead of the t's. So for instance, if I collect all of the coefficients in front of h naught, I get 2 times t cubed minus 3 times t squared and uh, plus uh, 1, right? So that's how I got this first term, and, and so on. And so this is just refactoring. Now, why would I do that? Let's say that I give you a curve, or really just a function, um, and I tell you my function is cubic, and I give you the value at 0, the value at 1, the slope at 0, and the slope at 1. Remember that's h0, h1, h2, and h3. Well, then the formula at the bottom of the slide actually gives me the cubic function 
that corresponds to those four pieces of information. I didn't have to solve a linear system of equation. I just plug in those four h values and out comes my cubic curve. So in other words, my cubic curve is sort of a combination of four functions, which I'm drawing a box around now. Now my cubic curve is also a combination of the monomial basis, like at the top. So essentially, what did I do? Well, in linear algebra terminology, we just did a change of basis, right? We started with the monomial basis. This is one particular basis for the set of cubic curves. And we translated to a different set of four functions that also can express cubic curves. But this is kind of convenient because it directly gives me the curve through two points and two tangents, rather than having to solve a linear system to translate from one to the other. So what are these four functions, the ones that I've boxed at the bottom of the slide? These are called the cubic ermite functions, and I've plotted them here. Uh, the color of the box corresponds to the color of the curve at the top. So remember that h0, what is h0? This is like p of 0. And take a look at the function h0 of t. Well, its value at t equals 0 is 1. Its value at t equals 1 is 0. And its slope at both of these points in time is 0. So if I change the coefficient of h0, does that affect the value of this linear combination at time one? No, because it gets scaled by zero, right? H zero of, of, of one is equal to zero. And similarly, it doesn't affect the slope at either of those points in time because the slope is always flat. Similarly, H one, notice that H one has flat slope at t equals zero and t equals one, but it takes on value one at t equals one, right? So this uh, blue function here is just controlling the value at t equals 1 without affecting the value at t equals 0 or the slope. Now the other two basis functions, notice that their value at time 0 and time 1 is 0, but they have slope 1 either at time 0 or at time 1, so they're just controlling the slope and no other piece of information. So these four functions together are called the cubic ermite basis. Uh, and this is just another basis for cubic functions. So one really important point to get out of this, a cubic function can be written always as a combination of 1, t, t squared, and t cubed. A cubic function can also always be written as a combination of these four ermite basis functions. There is no cubic function that can be written in one basis but not the other. So the only reason to use one of these bases or the other is for mathematical convenience, right? The uh, monomial basis is useful just because the functions are very simple to differentiate and kind of work with on paper. The Hermite basis is kind of nice because it prescribes geometric information about your curve. Um, in particular, in computer graphics, let's say that I want the curve P of T um, that has uh, these four pieces of information prescribed you know, p of 0, p of 1, p prime of 0, and p prime of 1. Well, I can write that function using the formula on the right-hand side, and no additional computation has to happen. Okay, so just to reiterate our point one more time, because this is really critical uh, for our, our linear algebra picture, what we did here was a change of basis, right? We started with one basis, which was the monomial functions. We ended up with another basis, which is called the Hermite basis. Uh, and they're equally expressive in the sense that the set of curves I can draw on the monomial basis is exactly the set of curves I can draw on the Hermit basis. Uh, but the Hermit basis somehow makes a little bit more sense from a geometric perspective because they're controlling the values and the slopes at time zero and time one. Whereas like if I tweaked these a, b, c, and d values, it's not totally clear what the geometric effect would be on our curve, right? It requires a little bit more thinking. Okay, so, so far uh, in our mathematics today, I've been using the word curve, but I really mean function, right? What we're doing is we're specifying a single function that goes from t into real values. But the motivation at the beginning of our lecture was to talk about curves, right? Like shapes in the plane. Uh, and we did that by talking about parametric geometry. Now, remember, a parametric curve is a function gamma of t, 
which goes from t values into x coordinates and y coordinates. So what can we do if we want to draw a parametric curve instead of a parametric function? Well, for example, if I use the phrase cubic curve, what I mean is that the x coordinate and the y uh, coordinate are separately cubic functions of t. Right? So for instance, I might write the x coordinate in the Hermit basis and the y coordinate in the Hermit basis, and these are just two different functions. So if I specify an Hermit curve in the plane, essentially what I would do is specify two points like x, y coordinates and two tangent vectors um, as also x, y uh, coordinates. And now I would use the Hermit basis independently in the two coordinates to come up with those cubic functions. So, right. Uh, so that's the, the basic trick here. So in order to go from functions to curves, we just think of each coordinate, like x and y, as independent functions of t, uh, each of which could be cubic if I wanted to use the Hermit basis. Now, the one distinction here is that you may have more than one parametrization of the same curve. So for instance, here are two different cubic curves that trace out the same piece of geometry. Right here, f1 uh, of t is a function that goes from t to the pair t comma 2t. Notice that this is uh, just tracing out the line y um, equals, I guess, uh, 2x. But I could also trace out the curve y equals 2x by using this parametric function here. Right? Notice that the y value is still 2 times the x value, and t goes from minus infinity to infinity, so t cubed does as well. So both of these trace out the same curve in the plane. What's the difference between them? Well, if I think of t like time, and this as the position of a car driving along the curve, Right, here's this car again. Sorry, I'm such a bad uh, artist. Well, in the first case, our, curve, our car drives along the curve with constant speed. And in the second case, our car kind of grinds to a halt at t equals zero. And then it picks up speed again and gets faster and faster and faster when it's drawing, driving along uh, the plane. Now, this is going to matter when we do animation, right? There, the time variable is really important. Um, when we're talking about vector graphics, the t variable is actually irrelevant. Okay, so now that we've talked about curves in the plane, just by essentially taking our expression of cubic functions and repeating it for each uh, coordinate, we're going to introduce one more basis, uh, which is going to give us an elegant algorithm for actually sampling points on a cubic curve. In other words, another nice algorithm for tessellation. In fact, it'll be a recursive technique. Uh, and this is specifically for, well, really for polynomial curves, but we're going to do it in the case of cubic curves. Um, and what this is going to lead us to is yet another basis for cubic functions. So to derive this technique, we're going to take a quick mathematical detour, and we're going to introduce one additional mathematical object which is called the cubic blossom of a curve. This is one of my favorite little mathematical constructions that looks really complicated, but we'll see it's actually quite simple. So here's the basic idea. Now we're going to step back from curves and just talk about functions again for a minute. Let's say that I have a cubic function f of t. Remember that's like, what, uh, a t cubed plus b t squared plus c t plus d. Now for every cubic polynomial, we're going to be able to come up with another object, which is the cubic blossom of that polynomial, which is going to be a function of three different variables, t1, t2, and t3. And we can define the cubic blossom axiomatically, and then we're going to do an example or two and see that it's actually not so complicated to find it in practice. Uh, the cubic blossom is going to satisfy a few properties. It's going to be symmetric. What that means is that if I take any two of the inputs to uh, my function uh, big F here, and I permute them, the value doesn't change. So like F of t1, t2, t3 equals F of t1, t3, t2 equals F of t2, t1, t3, and so on. Our function is going to be affine, meaning that it satisfies the uh, property that I've written here. 
Now, whenever you see a mathematical expression like this, you should step back 10 feet and look at it and say, okay, but why the heck uh, does this expression make any sense? Um, essentially, what it's saying is that if I draw a line in any one of the inputs to my function, um, I can kind of pull out the same line uh, in the outputs, right? So this is kind of like linearity, but specifically through uh, 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 points. Okay, and then finally, well, the first two uh, properties don't actually relate the blossom to the original input uh, function f. The third one is going to do that um, using a, something called the diagonal property, which says that if I put the same value into big F three times, uh, what I reproduce is my original cubic function. Okay, so I claim that for every cubic polynomial, I can come up with a cubic blossom f of t1, t2, t3 that satisfies all three of these axioms. Let's do a few examples. So let's say that my function is f of t equals t cubed. And I'm trying to come up with the cubic blossom of this function. Well, what do I know? Well, by the diagonal property, uh, I know that if I put in t three times, I should get t cubed. So maybe I come up with the following, right? So for big F, t2, t3. Well, what would happen if I put in t1 cubed? Well, okay, that satisfies the diagonal property, but it's certainly not symmetric, right? Uh, if I swapped t1 and t2, well, what would happen? Well, then I might, you know, I, I, would, I might start with, a, you know, so let's say I put in 1, 0, 0. Well, then f of 1, 0, 0 is 1, but f of 0, 1, 0 is 0, the way I've written it. So that's failed. Okay, so I know that it has to be symmetric in t1, t2, and t3. So maybe I improve my function a little bit by saying, aha, well, it has to be symmetric. So maybe I take t1 cubed plus t2 cubed plus t3 cubed, and I divide the whole thing by 3. Well, now this thing is symmetric, right? If I swap any of the inputs, I'll get the same value. But it's not affine. It doesn't look linear in t1, t2, and t3 if I hold the other guys fixed. It really doesn't look affine. If, uh, uh, yeah, not quite the same as linear, but close. So now I make another observation. Fortunately, we have to erase this guy. It wasn't quite right. Which is that the following function is affine. t1 times t2 times t3. Right? Like if I hold t1 and t2 fixed and just vary t3, this thing looks like a line. And that's sort of the property that I'm looking for in the uh, affine property. So what could I do? Well, if I write down the following function, t1, t2, t3, well, what happens if I put t, t, and t as the three inputs? Well, I get t cubed, which is the original function. So it satisfies the diagonal property. This thing is clearly symmetric, right? Because it's, it's sort of treating all three inputs democratically. And moreover, if I freeze two of the inputs and I just vary the third, uh, it has this sort of linear structure, so it's actually affine. So this is the cubic blossom of t cubed. Okay, let's do a second example. In particular, uh, let's think about the function f of t equals t squared. So in this case, uh, kind of following the same pattern that we had before, Right? We might want to blossom it by using a function like t1, t2. This uh, satisfies the diagonal and affine properties, essentially by the same argument that we made about t cubed, but it does not satisfy the symmetric one. In particular, remember that f is a function of t1, t2, and t3, but t3 doesn't appear in our expression anywhere. So what could I do? Well. One trick would be to combine every possible pair of ti times tj. Right? So I could do t1 times t2 plus t2 times t3 plus t1 times t3. And these are all the different affine functions that I can think of that 
multiply two of the input variables and don't use any one of them twice. But of course there are three terms here, so to satisfy the diagonal property, I need to divide by three. Right? So this is the cubic blossom of f of t equals t squared. And of course the easiest cubic blossom, you know, if f of t equals one, <laughs> well, in that case, uh, we can just have that our cubic blossom big F also equals one. It's easy to check that that satisfies all three of those properties. Incidentally, this last one is a nice example of why affine is not linear, right? The function f of t equals 1 is not a linear function, but it is uh, affine. Uh, so here uh, are a bunch of the examples we just did. I've included a fourth one, which is f of t equals t. So what do you think we're going to do if we have a generic cubic function that we want to blossom? Well, essentially, we can just linearly combine these four functions I've given you on this slide. So this is just a totally formulaic uh, way to do blossoming, right? Uh, is, which is, let's say that I label these big Fs as big F1, big F2, big F3, big F4. And I give you an exercise like this, which is to find the cubic blossom of 3t cubed minus t plus 1. Well, what could I do? I could... Again, maybe label these things. Then uh, one thing that you can check is that the blossom of this function is nothing more than 3 times f3 minus, oops, I don't know why that happens, 3 times f3 minus f1, oops, uh, <laughs> I guess I've written this in a funny way. So I'll, I'll stick with the notation on the slide. I probably should have uh, matched the degree with the subscript. But using my bad notation, <laughs> which I do not encourage you to do on your homework, I guess this would be 3 times f1 uh, minus t, which in my weird notation is f3 uh, plus 1, which is f4. Again, this is not standard notation. This is just the thing that I wrote down while giving lecture. Uh, in general, you should expand and plug in all of these different functions to get a full uh, expression. If you have any questions about that, please ask on Piazza. I realize that might have been confusing. Okay, so that's the blossom of a cubic function. If I want the blossom of a cubic curve, unsurprisingly, I just blossom each of the coordinate functions separately. So what that gives me is I've, I've given you this little vector notation here. It essentially gives me a vector f as a function t1, t2, t3 that satisfies those affine, diagonal, and symmetric properties separately in each of the three or, or, or two coordinates, like the x coordinate and the y coordinate. So why did we do all this work, <laughs> right? Like why did I define this crazy object called the cubic blossom? Well, Let's say that I have a cubic curve. Hopefully the construction on the previous couple slides convinced you that given a cubic curve, I could obtain its blossom fairly easily. But instead, one thing that I'm gonna do is specify the blossom of my cubic curve directly and use that to actually give me the cubic curve itself. So in particular, if I had the blossom, like what I've drawn on the, this, this function here, I could evaluate it on three different or four different inputs, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1. All right, this is a function of three input variables, t1, t2, t3. Well, what is this cubic blossom? Remember that it's, in this case, it has three inputs, so it goes from R3, and it maps to points on the plane, right, because I took the, co uh, the blossom of the two coordinates separately. So if I evaluate on these four inputs, this is just four different points on the plane coming from this cubic function of t1, t2, and t3. So I can plot these four points. And meanwhile, um, if I want my actual cubic curve, how do I get it? Well, that's f of t. Well, by the diagonal property, I could put in just d three times supposed to be a comma. Okay, so I can specify the blossom with these four values here, and then when I want to evaluate my curve, 
Well, I'm just going to put in uh, uh, a bunch of T's. So why would I do that? Well, it turns out that these four points actually have a really nice geometric interpretation. And I've drawn that here. So in particular, if I take a cubic curve, I compute its blossom. I'm going to drop that little vector sign over the letter F, just out of laziness. And I evaluate these four points. I get a structure that looks something like what I've shown you on the slide. This is something called the cubic control polygon. Okay, so the cubic curve uh, I've drawn in green here, right? This is like f of t. Remember, as a reminder, that means that the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate are both cubic functions of t. And I've drawn four points of its cubic blossom, f of 0, 0, 0, f of 1, 1, 1, f of 0, 0, 1, and f of 0, 1, 1. Okay? Now, one thing that you can already tell Notice the, the curve goes through these two points, and that makes sense, right? This is just by the diagonal property of cubic blossoms. The more mysterious aspect is that if I draw the line segment from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 1, or the line segment from 0, 1, 1 to 1, 1, 1, notice that I get tangents to the curve. In fact, one thing that you can check at home is if I have the cubic blossom and I evaluate it at those four uh, points, um, in fact, what I get is that the difference between the first and the second control point is three times the tangent at time zero, and the difference between uh, the third and the fourth control point is three times the tangent at time one. This is kind of magic that this happens, but it's just a byproduct of algebra. Now, why go to all this work? Well, let's drop that green curve for a second and just look at those four points. Now, one thing that I could do, initially just for fun, but we're going to see that a really beautiful pattern emerges, is I could take every edge on my control polygon and I could subdivide it in half. I could draw a point that's halfway down each of these edges. Now, the question is, so here's what those, that looks like in a nicer uh, PowerPoint uh, drawing. What is the label of these three points that I've just drawn? Well, notice that if I look at the inputs to my cubic blossom f at the first two control points, they have two values in common, right? There's two zeros that go into f uh, in, in two of its slots, and the third value varies from 0 to 1. Now, by the affine property, right, if two things remain constant and the third one is varying, then I can actually come up with a label for this point. This is big F of 0, 0, right? Those two are remaining constant. And our function kind of looks linear um, for the third uh, parameter, which is varying. So this is F of 0, 0, 1 half. Now, similarly, if I look at the second and the third control point, notice that they have two values in common, in this case, 0 and 1. So the label of this middle point kind of looks like 0, 1 half, 1. And here it's going to look like 1 half, 1, 1. OK? So let's uh, write that in nicer PowerPoint math. Now, by the symmetry property of the cubic blossom, I can flip the inputs any way that I want. And that's not going to change the locations of these points. So I'm going to move the values. Notice the second and the third points that I've drawn, the inputs are changing, to put the 1 half in the third slot. So now all three of my points have the 1 half in the third slot. Now I'm going to do a really sneaky thing. I'm going to draw line segments between these new points that I've drawn, like that. I'm going to subdivide them in half and ask, what is the label of those points, again, in my cubic blossom? Well, notice that the, the first uh, new point and the second new point have two values in common, now 0 and 1 half. So if I divide this line segment in half, it's just this third value that's varying. So halfway in between, I get the input 0, 1 half, 1 half. And similarly, if I look at the second pair of points, I'll get the label 1 half, 1, 1 half, right? Because now uh, these two guys have two values in common, the 1 
and the one half. And so it's the first slot that's changing. Okay, so if I do this one more time, I subdivide the line segment in between those two new points. I'm going to get the label one half, one half, one half. And by the diagonal property, that's f of one half. Now, notice what just happened. I took the control polygon, which initially encoded two points on my curve, f of zero and f of one. And by doing this subdivision, I ended up with a new point, which is also on my curve, f of 1 half. In fact, if I draw for you that, that green curve that we had on an older slide, notice it goes right through that uh, point that we just drew. Now, this is just totally magic, right? Notice what we did. I mean, we, we, I, I used a lot of words to justify a very simple algorithm. I took the three input line segments, I divided them in half. I drew two more line segments, I divided those in half. I drew a third line segment, I drew, divided that in half, uh, and I got f of one half. Okay, we're gonna do this many more times. Of course, I'm gonna ask you to do this on the exam for this course, I can't help it. And there's so many beautiful properties of the cubic control polygon that are worth exploring. This is such a cool object. So for example, take a look, I'm gonna change the color of my pen, um, at just the four points on the bottom half. These four points are actually the control points for the left-hand side of my curve. And similarly, if I look at the four points on the right half, these are the control points for the right-hand side of my curve. So for example, if I wanted f of one quarter, I could get it by exactly the same algorithm. Subdivide everything in half, draw line segments, subdivide in half, draw a line segment, and aha, I got f of one quarter, and so on. So the really cool thing that happened is this algorithm, which essentially is just subdividing edges, actually gives me a recursive technique for giving more and more points on a cubic curve and the control points of the different pieces of the segments uh, that I got on my curve. As a quick exercise, let's find f of 1 half given these four control points for my cubic curve. Now I could go through all of that exercise with the cubic blossom and apply the affine property and so on, or hopefully I've convinced you that all I really have to do is subdivide every edge in half in my polygon, draw line segments, subdivide that new edge in half, draw another line segment, so divide that edge in half, and this is f of one half. The fact that it intersects the original control polygon, at least approximately, is just by luck of uh, this particular object. Yeah. Um, so this cubic curve probably looks something. I'm really bad at drawing this stuff. Something like it has to go through this point and have that tangent. Something like that. Okay. So this is our nice recursive technique for finding more points on a cubic curve given its control polygon. And for instance, if I wanted the control polygon for the left half of this segment, it would just be these four inner points. Okay, what if I wanted f of one quarter? One thing you can do is go back and check my argument. Um, but essentially by just going a quarter of the way along each line segment, uh, that's what I'll get. You can derive that using that uh, cubic blossom technique again. So this technique of take all the edges in the control polygon, divide them in half, take those edges, divide them in half, and so on. Um, this technique is known as the de Castle-Joe algorithm. And it essentially says, if I have the four control points on a cubic curve, I can subdivide a bunch of line segments to find any other point on that cubic curve. Moreover, um, if I take this sort of bottom envelope of the, the, the points that I computed, Right, so this is just the uh, bottom guys. Then I get the control points for the left-hand side and the right-hand side of my curve. And that gives me a recursive technique for further tessellating uh, this, this cubic object. So this is a really fun algorithm. Um, there are many different ways to understand cubic curves given the uh, cubic control polygon. If you plug through the calculations that we already did, um, one thing that you can convince yourself uh, very similarly to how we derived the Hermite basis, is that we can come up with a third basis known as the Bernstein basis for cubic polynomials. 
And what this basis does is it's yet another way to write down a cubic curve, but this time, rather than expressing our cur cubic curve using, oof, rather than expressing our cubic, <laughs> our cubic curve given two points and two tangents, instead, we're going to express it using four points, but these four points don't all intersect the curve necessarily, rather, two points of them do, and two points are these other two control points of the polygon. The one thing you can check is that if I define these four functions b0, b1, b2, and b3, then a, uh, a cubic function can be written, uh, uh, as, as I've given you at the bottom of the slide, given these four uh, points on the control polygon. Right, so this is yet another way to uh, write down a cubic curve in another basis, and this basis is convenient for given the uh, values of the blossom with these four inputs, or equivalently, given these four control points, I can directly write down the function f of t without doing any additional calculation by using this other cubic basis. Now, of course, if we go back to our linear algebra, we should ask, like, how do we go from the Bernstein basis to that canonical monomial basis and back? Uh, and of course, uh, your answer, basically any time in this class when we say, how do I go from something to something else, uh, is to use a change of basis, right? Which just looks like a matrix. Uh, so what are we going to do? We can take our Bernstein polynomials, those are given on the slide here. You probably want to expand out the, uh, the cubes and the squares and so on. So I've done that uh, here for you. I'm not going to force you to do all the algebra at home. Well, by taking these relationships and just writing them in a nicer fashion, like we've already done earlier in this lecture, uh, we get this nice relationship between the Bernstein polynomials and the monomials, which are just related to one another using this matrix B. Okay. So what if I want to go in the other direction? So in other words, uh, I want to get the coefficients in front of the uh, um, Bernstein basis given the coefficients in front of the monomials. Well, it's just a question of inverting that matrix. So what have we done here? Essentially, in this uh, lecture, we've written down three different bases for the set of cubic curves. There's a monomial basis, which is convenient algebraically, but not terribly meaningful geometrically. These, th there's the Hermite basis, uh, which is useful for specifying a curve given its value at uh, two points in time and its tangent at two points in time. And there's the Bernstein basis, which is convenient for expressing a curve uh, given its four cubic control points. Now, again, the important thing to get out of this lecture is that there's not any cubic curve that can be written in one of these bases and not the other. It's just a question of convenience. All right, so let's conclude our discussion for today with essentially just a nice piece of notation that's worth being aware of. This isn't terribly important, but it does create one nice way to convert from one basis for a curve segment to another. Um, recall that essentially we can think of a curve as a function p of t, where you know t is time, p is a point. Uh, so we can think of our point expanded as a column vector of two values. Uh, and now essentially what we've covered in this lecture is a really nice factorization of our cubic curve function. <laughs> now in particular, uh, what I've written here, I have the cubic monomial basis on the right hand side. That's just the set of uh, monomial functions 1 t, t squared, t cubed. And essentially, the whole point of our discussion today is that that's probably not the most useful basis uh, for working with cubic curves. It's a perfectly valid basis. It's just as expressive as any other basis for cubic curves. Uh, but it doesn't really help us when our input is like two points and two tangents or four control points. Um, so it's kind of hard to work with. So instead, one way to understand what we've done today is that essentially we've introduced a factorization uh, that looks like what I've shown you on the slide here. Now what we can do is take uh, this vector of monomial functions and we can pre-multiply it by a matrix we can call the spline matrix, which essentially takes you from these simple monomial functions to more complicated ones. So for example, if we look at just the first row here, 
If we multiply that by the monomial basis, what will we get? We'll get one minus three t plus three t squared minus t cubed, right? So that would be the, uh, the first row of the product of the uh, two matrices farthest to the right, uh, and so on. And so essentially, we can think of this product of the spline matrix times the monomial basis uh, as just writing down a new matrix, um, or rather a new vector uh, of basis functions uh, that might be more convenient. So for example, here, uh, we've given you the matrix for the Bernstein polynomials. And then finally, um, one thing that you can convince yourself is that when you evaluate your function uh, for a specific set of control points, essentially you're taking this uh, matrix on the right-hand side of basis functions, and you're pre-multiplying it by one more matrix, sometimes called the geometry matrix, which contains the control points. Now, what we'll see uh, later is that this can be a convenient way uh, to change basis between uh, different polynomials. So for example, maybe I want to know how to write my cubic curve, uh, not just in the Bernstein polynomials, but in the Hermite uh, polynomials. So that would be used to answer questions like, you know, I specified my curve with four control points, but now I want to know the way I could have specified the same curve using two points and two tangents. Um, essentially, I can do that by doing different linear algebra manipulations on this expression here, uh, which is a perspective that we're going to pursue more uh, in the next lecture. So, in general, um, this gives us a nice formulation of uh, these spline segments, um, factored as three pieces, right? A geometry matrix multiplied by a spline basis matrix multiplied by the monomial basis, right? So now the monomial basis is sort of taking care of the time dependence, the spline basis matrix uh, is taking care of the uh, useful spline basis that I choose for my particular application, and the geometry matrix is giving me the details of my specific curve, like the positions of the control points, um, whereas the spline basis is totally general. Uh, and so this is kind of a nice compact expression, and, and it'll be a nice way to convert between different types of splines. So just as a quick recap of what we've covered today, um, notice that we've essentially learned that the set of cubic polynomials follow, they form a four-dimensional vector space, right? They're spanned by one t, t squared, t cubed, but that's not the only spanning set of functions, right? A different spanning set would be the Hermite polynomials, and yet another spanning set would be the set of Bernstein polynomials. Uh, and so these different sets of functions all are equally expressive in the sense that they all can capture the set of cubic curves, um, but the Bernstein and our meat bases are useful uh, because they directly allow us to read off our cubic function given different types of input data, right? So we don't have to like solve a problem that tells me, find me the equation of the curve with these two points and these two tangents. I get it directly out of using the Hermite basis, for example. And changing between these is as simple as using matrices. Now, what we haven't covered is how to essentially construct a curve given more than four pieces of information. Uh, and that's going to be our goal for next time. And the basic inspiration here is that raising the degree of our curve, like we might say, okay, well, if we're given five pieces of information or 10, uh, we'll just use a higher degree polynomial. Uh, you get all kinds of crazy artifacts in your curve, like what you see here, um, which is known as a runge phenomenon. Uh, that start to appear the more points that you add. Essentially, interpolating data using polynomials becomes really weird with a higher degree polynomial. This is a fun excuse for me to show you my favorite figure from a math paper. Um, but essentially, the point here is that one cubic curve is not going to be enough to draw this uh, really funny little diagram here. Uh, and moreover, a really, really high degree polynomial is unlikely to go right through this crazy uh, curve that we've drawn here. So instead, what we'll do in the next lecture is we're going to take little pieces of the curves that we've drawn, cover those with like cubic segments, and then we're going to draw machinery for essentially gluing multiple cubic segments together to form an entire curve network. And that idea is going to be something called a spline. This is a piecewise polynomial. So it's just a bunch of polynomial pieces all glued together. So here's a quick uh, recap. A Bezier curve um, is just a parametric curve uh, defined using the Bernstein polynomials. Uh, and, and more broadly, 
the uh, cubic curves are sort of the building blocks for larger objects that we will uh, cover in the, the coming lecture. And the way that we get cubic curves is by linearly combining uh, different basis functions. And there are many different sets of essentially four basis functions we can use to describe a cubic curve depending on our setting, right? Whether we have points and tangents, control points, and so on. Um, we also covered a technique called the de castel joux algorithm, which is useful for taking the four points of a curve specifically in the Bernstein basis um, and generating more points along those curves, as well as the control points for the segments inside of those. And all of these different things that we've talked about today are linear algebra. Now, one thing that I want to reassure you all, um, to me, this is one of the hardest lectures in 6837, and of course it appears right at the beginning. Um, so please don't be discouraged. If the math here is a little heavy or abstract, I promise you it actually gets easier from here. Uh, and I'm more than happy to work with you all to make sure you understand all the different moving parts uh, in the lecture that we just covered. So you'll see that with some practice, the ideas here are actually pretty straightforward. They just require a bit of messing around, writing down some math, and doing the homework assignments in this course. So with that, we'll see you next time uh, to talk about gluing multiple curves together. Thanks.